Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about one of the biggest international disasters in college football history and what might be the fire Festival of Games, when Ball State and Ohio were set to play in Ireland in 1990 and the game got cancelled not even two weeks before it was set to kick off. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. Also join me tomorrow night on Twitch at 9pm Eastern, where we'll play NFL trivia for a chance to win cash prizes. Link to join below. And now, on with our feature presentation. Sometimes, the best deals in life that we make are the ones that we don't make. Sometimes, the best thing that can happen is when you want something to happen, and you don't get it. Because what you wound up with instead was either a million times better, or what you would have gotten would have been a giant bullet. As an example, remember when the Cleveland Browns almost gave up a second round pick and a third round pick to the Cincinnati Bengals for quarterback AJ McCarron, but they couldn't get the deal off in time? I'm sure the Browns are incredibly happy that the trade did not go through, because that would have been an incredible disaster if it did. However, there is one of these aborted trades that doesn't get talked about a whole lot and has seemingly been lost throughout NFL history, even though it shouldn't, because just the possibility that this almost happened seemed unfathomable. This is legendary Oakland Raiders running back Pete Banaszak. When you think of players to wear the number 40 jersey and suit up in the silver and black, he's the first name that comes to mind, and he might be the only name that comes to mind. When you think of the 70s Raiders and think of that offense, you think of Pete Banaszak. And it almost never happened. Because in 1969, the Raiders were moments away from having a deal to send him off, and to get him out of Oakland. And this is the story behind the greatest failed trade in the over 60-year history of the Raiders franchise. Before I talk about the trade in question, we need some context to understand who Pete Banaszak was, why the Raiders wanted to trade him in the first place, and who they were looking at receiving in exchange. In 1966, the Raiders were looking to bolster up a rushing attack that didn't have a whole lot going for it, especially when it came to finding the end zone. The Raiders only went 4-10 in 1965, and a big reason why was because they didn't have a strong running game down by the goal line, as they ended the year 7th out of 8 teams in rushing touchdowns. The Raiders spent their 5th round pick on Miami running back Pete Banaszak, hoping that he could be somewhat of a goal line threat and could be a bulldozer, which the Raiders didn't exactly have, and they were hoping that he could alleviate some of the pressure off of Clem Daniels, who, while great in 1965 by making it to the All-Star game, was the only player on the Raiders with at least 300 yards rushing. As a side note, to learn more about the career of Clem Daniels, click the card in the upper right corner. And through the first three seasons that he was in Oakland, Banaszak knew his role and was successful when called upon. After not doing a whole lot in 1966 and the first half of 1967, he burst onto the scene and made a name for himself at the end of that 1967 campaign. Over the final three regular season games that year, Banaszak had 234 rushing yards and over 5.5 yards per carry as the Raiders won all three of those games, easily winning the AFL West with a 13-1 record. He then shone in the 1967 AFL Championship against the Houston Oilers when he was given an expanded workload and got the ball 15 times for 116 yards, averaging over 7.7 .7 yards per carry. The Raiders won that game convincingly, taking a 40-7, and they made it to their first Super Bowl in franchise history. Although the Raiders fell to the Green Bay Packers, Banaszak finished second on the team in that game in receiving yards, with a very nice 69 yards. Now, entering the 1969 season, Banaszak wasn't going to be starting, but it was no fault of his own. He was somewhat of a super sub, simply because the Raiders had so many good options to give the ball to. They had Hewitt Dixon, who was named a first-team All-Pro and an All-Star in 1968, and who made it to the All-Star game in each of the past three seasons. And they had Charlie Smith, who led the AFL in 1968 in his very first season with 5.3 yards per carry. Still, the Raiders value Banaszak enough that they gave him a substantial pay raise entering 1969 to be the backup to both the running back and the fullback position. As Banaszak said on that, I agreed to that because I already knew both jobs, and the extra money seemed nice after having an off-again, on-again season in 1968. However, despite being an incredible depth option, and despite the Raiders clearly valuing his services if they were upping his pay by a hefty amount entering his fourth year, there's one thing more valuable than having a good depth player and that is having a good starter. In 1968, the Oakland Raiders went 12-2, once again winning the AFL West and making it to the postseason. And one of the reasons why they did it was the strength of their pass defense, which finished in the top half of the nine-team league in every major statistical category, including first in passing touchdowns allowed, second in yards per attempt, and third in interceptions. Their pass defense was so good that in their season opener that year against the Buffalo Bills, which the Raiders won 48-6, the Bills finished the game with negative 19 net passing yards. Negative 19. Whether you were alive or not back on September 15, 1968, 
you had more net passing yards on that day than the Buffalo Bills did. Their pass defense was a strength, and especially in the AFL, which had tons of great quarterbacks and quarterbacks on the rise like Bob Greasy, Len Dawson, Joe Namath, and John Hadle, the Raiders knew that it needed to remain strong. And one of the anchors of that pass defense is the man that you've been watching this whole time. This is Roger Byrd, and he joined the Raiders in 1966 while establishing himself as a solid safety, as well as one of the premier punt returners in the American Football League. Byrd had three interceptions in 1968, including a pick six, and had been the team's primary starter at one of the safety positions in each of his first three seasons. He also added a critical element on special teams, where he led the AFL in punt return yards in 1966 and 1967. And in 1967, he even led the AFL by averaging 13.3 yards per return, being named a second-team All-Pro for his efforts. In fact, he was so good that by the end of the 1968 season, he was fifth all-time in pro football history in yards per punt return. Bird was an electric and explosive player who was good on defense and special teams. He was one of those guys that it didn't seem like the Raiders could afford to lose. But sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He was dealing with a shoulder injury, and now the Raiders needed some help badly at the safety spot. They could move George Atkinson, their seventh-round pick from 1968 who was named an All-Star and was named the Defensive Rookie of the Year, over from cornerback to safety. But before they did that and potentially messed with a good thing, they had another idea in mind. Head coach John Madden loved Pete Banaszak. However, he wasn't going to start, as Madden called Hubert Dixon the premier fullback in the AFL, and that it was great to have great depth like Banaszak behind him. And when you have a giant hole in your secondary now, and have the chance to upgrade it by getting rid of a player that wasn't starting or seeing a ton of snaps because of it, well, it seems like a no-brainer. Fortunately, the Raiders had a trade partner, because just as the Raiders were looking to add a defensive back, the Miami Dolphins were looking to get rid of one. This is Dick Westmoreland. He had been in the AFL since 1963, and had been one of the top cornerbacks in the league for a fairly long period of time. In 1963, as an undrafted rookie, he was named a second-team All-Pro by the Associated Press, and won this award again in 1964 after finishing the season with six interceptions, which ranked inside the top ten of the AFL. In 1966, Westmoreland found his way onto the expansion Miami Dolphins, and immediately became a starter. During the 1967 season, he made it to the first All-Star game of his career after he led the league with ten interceptions. No other player on Miami had more than four picks, and here was Westmoreland with ten, being an absolute ball hawk. But by 1969, the relationship between Westmoreland and the team had soured pretty heavily. After a somewhat disappointing 1968 season, Westmoreland was benched in favor of Lloyd Mumford, the team's 16th round pick from the most recent draft out of Texas Southern. As a side note, to learn more about the career of Mumford, in particular, his incredible performance at Super Bowl VII a few years later, click the card in the upper right corner. And let's just say that Westmoreland was not happy about sitting on the bench. As he said, I hear all this talk, and my pride is hurt. I know what kind of cornerback I am. I know I'm good enough. That's not bragging. That's confidence in myself. I know I can play for a long time. I'm only 27. And Westmoreland was adamant about playing, saying I'm going to talk to head coach George Wilson and have this thing out. I don't want to sit on the bench. I've got to play. That's just me. I'm not a bench sitter. Even when I'm out of the game, I'm on my knees on the sidelines, playing every minute as though I were in there myself. And if that wasn't bad enough, when Westmoreland heard the news about his benching, he did not take it well. He was already missing practice and not getting reps because of a groin injury, but when he heard this news, instead of watching practice, he took a walk around the block and kept walking until practice was over, as he couldn't bear to watch. Westmoreland said on Wilson's belief that he had to prove that he had to earn a starting job, hell, I didn't know a six-year veteran was supposed to still be on trial. Dick Westmoreland wanted out. The Raiders needed help badly in the secondary and they sensed a golden opportunity down in Miami, as they could replace Roger Bird with a guy who still seemingly had a lot left in the tank, and was two years removed from leading the league in interceptions. And with that, talks began to intensify. In early September of 1969, as all of this was happening, Raiders owner Al Davis was watching the preseason game between the Boston Patriots and Miami Dolphins down in Birmingham, Alabama at Legion Field. At halftime of the game, Davis spoke with Dolphins owner Joe Robbie, presumably about the situation with Westmoreland. And after the game, Davis spoke with Jimmy Warren, a cornerback on the Dolphins, and asked him if he believed that Westmoreland would make a good safety. This immediately made Warren alert to the idea that something was going on. As Warren said on Davis, he's up to something. He doesn't go in for idle talk. Joe Thomas, the player personnel director of the Dolphins, 
flat out admitted that Davis was interested in Westmoreland, saying naturally, Davis is interested if he can get him at a good price. While the Dolphins were debating things over, and whether they wanted Westmoreland as their third cornerback, or whether they felt comfortable going in with Dick Washington at that spot, Thomas basically admitted that there was a deal in the works and was ready to go. Thomas said, There's no trade at the moment, but if Davis calls tomorrow, and you can figure out the rest. And supposedly, the deal in some form revolved around Dick Westmoreland going to the Oakland Raiders and the player coming back to Miami in return being Pete Banasak. The Dolphins would get to bolster up their running game and their offense, especially since Larry Zonka, their starting fullback, was out indefinitely with head problems, and the Raiders would get their replacement in the secondary for the injured Roger Bird. As a side note, to learn more about Larry Zonka during that 1969 season, click the card in the upper right corner. The trade talks were so prevalent that Banasek had to comment on them and address the rumors, seemingly going through all five stages of grief at once. Banasek said, I can't understand such talk. I've heard stitches of conversation around it, and it's shocking to me. He then added, But then again, I'd love to play in Miami. The people there are fine folks, and I enjoyed my stay at the University of Miami. I've only met George Wilson a few times, but he's impressed me very much. He's a good man. I don't know. Everything seemed to be good, with the talks heating up. And then, despite comments and clear interest on both sides, the deal fell through and never happened. No one knows why the trade fell through. Maybe the Dolphins or the Raiders were asking for too much, and that forced one side to reevaluate. Maybe the Dolphins decided that even though Westmoreland was not going to be starting, that they still wanted him on the team as their third cornerback for those situations, or just in case anything happened to Jimmy Warren or Lloyd Mumford. Maybe the Dolphins felt confident that Larry Zaka would be able to return quickly, and that ended their desire to pick up Vanizak. Or maybe the Raiders liked George Atkinson sliding over to safety, and that ended their desire to pick up Westmoreland. Whatever the case, there was no deal. And let's just say that the Raiders dodged an absolute bullet, because this non-deal was an easy win for Oakland. The Raiders wound up keeping Pete Banaszak, and I think it's safe to say that he had a great career with the Raiders. He lasted with the team all the way through 1978. In 1975, he led the entire NFL by scoring 16 rushing touchdowns, being an absolute machine down by the goal line. The Raiders had been around for over 60 years at this point, and Banaszak's 16 rushing touchdowns in 1975 still remains a franchise record for most rushing touchdowns in a single season. And during the 1976 season, not only did he score a critical touchdown in the second half of the AFC Championship to give the Raiders a 24-7 victory over their arch-rival Pittsburgh Steelers, but he scored twice from the goal line at Super Bowl XI to give the Raiders their first Super Bowl title in franchise history. By the time Banaszak's career ended, he had 4,794 yards from scrimmage, along with 52 total touchdowns. And by the time he retired, his 47 rushing touchdowns were a franchise record by a hefty margin, although that mark has since been surpassed by Hall of Famer Marcus Allen, who scored 79. As for the guy that they didn't get in Dick Westmoreland, yeah, he never played pro football again after the 1969 season. His departure from the pro game was ugly with a capital U. After not playing in the final game of the regular season against the New York Jets, which the Dolphins lost 27-9, he basically went full scorched earth and demanded to be traded. As he said, I'm not going to sacrifice myself here. I don't think I've been treated fairly here. I'm not coming back to sit next year. I'm going in and asking them to trade me. He then followed that up with an incredibly laughable statement, saying, There are a lot of places I can play. The Jets need some quarterbacks. You watch. They're going to get riddled next week. During the game, Dolphins starting quarterback Rick Norton went 3-for-15 with no touchdowns, two interceptions, and a pass rating of 0.0 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Bold strategy on his end to say, yeah, the team that held our quarterback to a 0.0, .0 passer rating and a completion percentage of 20%? They suck at cornerback. They need me. Shocker, this plan did not work. It's a tough call to tell who won the non-trade. Did the Raiders benefit by not pulling the trigger and by keeping the guy that would play another decade for them, finish as the all-time leader in franchise history in rushing touchdowns, and would be an instrumental part of their victory at Super Bowl XI? Or would they have benefited from trading him away for a guy that was out of the league by the end of the year and seemed to have lost his mind on the way out? Again, it's tough to imagine Pete Banaszak being the Raiders legend that he is in any other uniform besides the silver and black. But we truly were moments away from having that happen. Maybe the best trade that the Raiders made in their 60-year history is the one that they never did. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. 
and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaragator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaragator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.